on Blues Radio International. We're here today in Studio C with Muriel Anderson. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. When I first uh, met you in Copper Mountain a few months ago, I was mesmerized by what you do, and we are honored to have you on Blues Radio International today. Well, thank you. It's so wonderful that my concert tour took me right in your backyard. Yeah, it worked <laughs> yeah. out perfectly for us in many different ways. I wanted to talk a little bit about your background um, when you started playing. I mean, you're a national finger-picking champion, although you're holding a harp guitar at the moment. Can you tell us how you got started in music? Well, you know, it's funny because I never thought I would be a soloist. I always thought that my greatest strengths were to make other people sound better with, uh, with my playing. And I started with folk and bluegrass and playing music with other people and just sharing the joy of music with people. And that's, that's the way I started, you know, through the tradition of the Old Town School of Folk Music and the Jones School of Folk Music. Uh, and then joined the school jazz band, and, and you know, there's a whole new terrain now to explore and uh, you know, find out, uh, you know, all these new harmonies. Uh, but the only way to study guitar in college was to study classical. And uh, so I kind of reluctantly went into classical guitar studies. And then again, over that summer, I heard the music of Christopher Parkening. And I was in love with that tone and that phrasing and set out to, to try to capture that. And so found uh, yet, yet another world. And so worlds keep on opening up in music. And now that I'm doing some concert touring and traveling, I'm continually finding uh, new music and uh, new whole worlds to open. And you've you've studied with the best. I mean, you're one of the few people I know who studied with both Chet Atkins and Christopher Parkening. It's well, remarkable. I've really been fortunate that uh, I've been able to learn from a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts, and that I've lived in this time uh, to have met so many great players in many different styles. You know, meeting. Uh, Andre Segovia meeting Jimmy Page, who taught me Stairway to Heaven, you know, and, <laughs> and then um, getting to hang out you know, a little bit with Doc Watson, my first guitar hero. And of course, Chet Atkins was uh, one of the greatest influences of my life. Really remarkable. Can you tell us about the beautiful instrument that you're holding? Well, yes. Uh, when I was starting classical, and I also was starting writing pieces in uh, a much more classical style, I was hearing these low bass notes like that, and and my guitar didn't make that sound. I kept on reaching for a, a note that wasn't there. So I'd seen pictures of a harp guitar, and I said, that's the instrument that can make that sound that I'm hearing. And so uh, I went out uh, to, to seek out a harp guitar and heard that there was a guitar player named Michael Hedges who played one. And so I went to a Michael Hedges concert um, and I was feeling a little out of place at this kind of rock club. And I sat next to an older couple who looked equally out of place. And it turns out that they were there also to see this instrument, this harp guitar, because they were writing a book about it. Uh, that was Guitars and Mandolins in America and asked me if I would record uh, for their book. So that's the first time I got to play a harp guitar is in recording that book. This is more strings than most people are going to see on one instrument in a lifetime. Can you describe what's going on? I see a traditional neck in the middle. You've got the bass up top, and then you have additional strings below. Yes, so uh, here, here I have this regular neck, and then down below I have, in this instrument, I have seven extra bass strings. So I have uh, different harp guitars that have different numbers of strings, just to make life more interesting. Uh, and um, Mike Doolin built this one for me, and I asked him if he could also add super trebles, which is this. So in addition, it has an extra bank of treble strings, and uh, this one is unique in that it has steel strings in the treble and nylon strings on the regular and the sub basses. Absolutely spectacular. Can you give us a taste of what this beautiful instrument sounds like? Okay, uh, I'll do one uh, first just on the uh, regular part and the sub basses, and I'll add some harmonics. And I uh, wanted to capture the sound of uh, the view from space. And this was inspired by the images from the space shuttle Discovery. 
And so uh, I start off with these harmonics like this. It's absolutely breathtaking. Oh, thank you. 
And it's been played in space too, right? Uh, well, uh, astronaut Susan Helms took uh, my heartstrings recording uh, up with her to the space shuttle. And uh, that was actually another assortment of, of music. This particular piece was not played in space yet. Okay. So I think it well, has yet to go. We'll have to make arrangements yes. for that. Yes. I can see why she chose your music as a soundtrack. What's the, uh, what's the process of composing a piece like that? Because that has a lot of different elements that many of our listeners are unfamiliar with. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to, you know, I, I was looking at the images as I was writing it and kind of getting into the feel of what did I want to express? What did this remind, remind me of? How to get some sparkly? And, uh, and this piece doesn't develop as much as most of my pieces, most most of my pieces has a, you know, develop into into a fugal arrangement or an A part and a B part, C part. This one wants to just hang out there, and say the same thing, uh, in a different way, and then come back to the same thing. So it's, uh, it's a different structure from the way I, I normally write. And to get that sparkly sound, I had learned this technique from from Chet Atkins, where you do a harmonic just barely touching at the halfway point with the index and plucking with a thumb, and then you intersperse uh, a finger, another finger with a regular string. So you intersperse one harmonic and one regular note. And that's kind of the sound I wanted to get, but I wanted it to be more spread out and, you know, and more sparkly. So with this one, I figured out, since I have two fingers here, I maybe can do one harmonic and two notes uh, coming up and the second time I, I reverse the direction of the fingers, so. And then I come down, just one harmonic and one note. And so uh, it's a kind of a complex technique. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's sort of my own <laughs> little thing that, uh, that I came up with in order to portray the kind of feeling and the sound that I was looking for. Your music has broadened into many other areas of art and life. I understand from an earlier interview that you had this theory of the centrality of music to life that came to you very early. Yes, I uh, was fascinated by, I kind of had this, this theory as a, as a third grader, <laughs> you know, my third grader theory, that the essence of life was music and that when we play music, we are in touch with uh, the very fabric of life, the very language of life. And uh, of course, I didn't say it in, in such, such an elegant way, but uh, that was you know, kind of my unproven theory. And then um, when I heard about fractals and, and string theory, and I was just elated that, oh, maybe there's some actual uh, truth to that, and maybe that, um, vibrations are the center of what makes us human beings, what's, what makes life. And that's why we, we react to vibrations. And that's why when we play music and get so much into it ourselves, we are actually interacting with ourselves vibrating. And so I think that's a, kind of a, a, a cool thought and uh, certainly plenty of reason to play music. <laughs> it is. And I, I think more as time goes on, the, the more we find out that you're right about this in a lot of ways. I, I, I think a lot about this because we broadcast the world and the original Adam and Eve were in Africa. We all share that same beating heart and that vibration that's a vital part of our continuing to be alive, we carry with us everywhere. And it's a vibration that even though our languages may be different, our cultures may be different, our politics may be diametrically opposed, you and I and everyone listening is sharing that vibration right now. And this is just another beautiful iteration of it, as I see it. Well, I, th I think it's important to continue that. That's one reason why I do a lot of teaching as I, as I travel. And I, on my website, uh, my YouTube channel, I have lessons and I'm starting a, a, a special channel on, on True Fire. And uh, so I'm trying to, to spread that and also started a little charity to help uh, get instruments and lessons to kids. Well, this is all wonderful. You have another song that has an interesting story behind it that's named after a spice. 
Oh, <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of ties into what we were talking about is that we we all know of music as the international language. And as I travel around, uh, I often end up playing and having these uh, deep conversations with people uh, who speak an entirely different language that I haven't learned yet, you know, <laughs> maybe I'm working on. Uh, but the other thing is that we share connections uh, when we get together and share a meal. And so as we travel, we share music, we share meals together. Uh, those are two things that, that really bring us together as a family and as, as a people. And so um, I started collecting recipes as we traveled and compiling them and writing or arranging a tune to go with each recipe. So I had put them all together into a book and called it Acoustic Chef. And finally, when I realized, okay, we completed the book, it's ready to go, then we went to Hungary and made goulash over an open fire with a young couple there. And it was so delicious that I realized we have to add this to the book. So uh, the, with the Hungarian goulash meant that I had to write a Hungarian tune. So I listened to some Hungarian gypsy players and came up with this. I call this paprika. Thank you. 
I'm, I'm so impressed that you move from not only musical genre to musical genre, but music culture to music culture. Well, yeah, there's uh, uh, different things and different t styles of music that make it really unique and intriguing. And the challenge is to find that. It might be in the timing. It might be in the tone of the notes, the way I, I grab the notes with my fingernails and fingertips. Uh, and it might be in the harmony. So it can be in uh, you know many different things that uh, create the character of a music. How, how does that evolve, though? Because you'd never played Hungarian music before. True, and all of a yes. sudden you set out to do this. You listen to some folk tunes. What's that process like? Well, you know, it's just uh, listening. It's just knowing how to listen. And that's the, the biggest part of music, and to even composing music, um, is listening to the, the building blocks that, that make your favorite music your favorite music, you know, <laughs> and that, that make it fun. And so, um, and, and then I just uh, let the muse take over. Uh, part of it is getting out of the way of the music and uh, letting the music write itself. So I, I feel like sometimes I, I use the word perhaps even too much that I capture the music. It's like it's running around free and it's my job to go capture it. But uh, the, the thing that even goes beyond this is that you picked up and you, you did a whole flamenco album. I mean, this, this is a tradition that people spend a lifetime studying in and of itself. And oh, and I could still spend another lifetime studying I'm it. Sure. I, what, there's so far to go with flamenco, yes. What, what drew you to flamenco? Uh, I was playing in Germany uh, in uh, an old castle, medieval castle, and I heard this music and I followed it. I said, that music is like the joy of life captured in music. What is that? And that was the duo Tierra Negra, um, German flamenco duo playing. And I thought, someday I'm going to get together with, with these guys and, uh, you know, and share that music with them. And some years later we did and uh, spent a day just all day long, maybe two full days long, just jamming, cooking and, and eating and uh, and, and nothing else, just all day long. And uh, we realized, you know, this was just so much fun, we had to continue it. So we recorded the New World Flamenco CD and went on tour. Really something beautiful. And uh, you never know what the next turn is going to bring. What, what would you like to play for us next? Do well, you have any, any I'll ideas? I'll play a new one that I wrote inspired by Tierra Negra and their style. And uh, so... This is one that I, uh, I wrote for Leo of uh, Tierra Negra, and I call it El Leon.
<laughs> trying to put myself in those flamenco shoes there for for a moment and but um also allowing me to be myself and so there's some things that in that tune that maybe a real flamenco player wouldn't do uh, so i uh, allow a little bit of originality as well but still trying to capture the essence of uh, of the flamenco you make it yours and you yeah. sing in french as well well yeah i, I figured that uh, I try to learn a little bit of the language of every place that I go. And I was working with a French guitarist at one time, and so I uh, figured that I should go in his direction as much as he goes in mine. So he learned English, and I, lear I learned French. And that was uh, touring with Jean-Félix Talan. What an amazing journey. But what would you like to play for us next? This is all so beautiful, and I'm, I'm so excited to be able to share it with our audience. Uh, um. We'll go back to the harp. Yes, I'll go back to the harp guitar. As uh, I could do the the French one for you, and uh, this is one that I had been wanting to record for a while, and uh, the quiche recipe gave me the excuse to do it. And so uh, I I really love this emphasis, and it pushes me as a composer, too, and as an arranger to uh, compose and ar arrange some new things that I might not otherwise do. So I'm already thinking about book two and, and where to go and uh, what cultures to discover, uh, what cuisine and what music is, is next. But uh, the, the French is, is lovely and I'm going to uh, use these t half step tuners on the harp guitar. So uh, normally I can only play in, in one key So um, I have a little lever here that changes by a half step. And so since this song uh, has some chromatic movement in the bass, I have to reach up and grab this little tuner just in time and then get back for the rest of it. So this will be the challenge in this tune, is to grab these, these half step tuners on the, on the sub basses uh, on the fly as I'm going. And this is Under Paris Skies. Le ciel de Paris s'envole une chanson. Elle est née d'aujourd'hui dans le cœur d'un garçon. 
Sur le ciel de Paris marcha les gens Le bon air se construit en air fait par eux. Sur le pont de Bercy, à philosophe, ainsi de se siennes, quelques bardons puis les jambes parmi Sur le ciel de Paris, jusque soir vont chanter. That's quite an acrobatic feat, as well as being a musical triumph. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> really beautiful. How has uh, your thinking about music changed as you've started to involve the cooking and these other sensory experiences? It, has it evolved your view of music? Yes, and also when I play on tour live, most of the time I'm playing with visuals behind me. My partner, uh, Brian Allen, travels with me, and uh, we've worked together uh, some gorgeous visuals that go behind me and match the music. And so there's the, the extra challenge of uh, being sure that uh, my music goes, goes right in sync with the changes in the images. Very nice. I also appreciate that, and I hope that anyone who's able to pick up one of your CDs appreciates the beautiful intersection of musical and visual art that you've created. Your, your CDs are not the typical CD in terms of packaging. Oh well, yeah, now I'm doing something different with, with, each, uh, with each new release. I have a release uh, called Eclipse that doubles as a greeting card. So you can listen to the CD and then put it back in the greeting card and put it in the envelope and put two stamps on it and send it to someone. So it's a, a, another way of, of sharing the music, um, all harp guitar music inspired by the, the Eclipse. And uh, the uh, Nightlight Daylight one, that's, I've got one here. Uh, let's see, right here. Um, this is one that uh, is, uh, two, it's a double CD, so 30 songs all together. And uh, one's, I'm opening the package, that's what you're hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a CD of music to wake up to and a CD of music to go to sleep to. And then when you push the moon, it lights up and there's a shooting star. Uh, so that was a big project to design the fiber optics, uh, get someone to uh, program it and uh, get it manufactured. And so it's still the only CD with, with fiber optics in the cover. Uh, and uh, the, it was uh, the, the CD that deserved this because this is the one CD that I just, um, decided it was going to have no 
no maximum time limit and whatever every song needed, that's what it would get. And so I have wonderful guests playing with me, uh, Stanley Jordan, Earl Klug play on some cuts, Tommy Emanuel's on one, uh, uh, the uh, great uh, string players, one, there's a couple of tunes that call for a uh, string ensemble, uh, players from the Nashville Symphony are there, and uh, uh, Mark Kibble, uh, the singer from Take Six, uh, does all the, all the vocal uh, harmonies on there, Phil Keggy, and my favorite drummer, Danny Gottlieb from Pat Metheny Group. And, uh, of course, uh, Phil Keggy plays on a lot of this. So it was uh, just a joy to play with these uh, wonderful people, all wonderful people as well as wonderful musicians. And that's the energy that I didn't know if it would translate through. You know, the fun that we were having in the studio, and people uh, tell me time and time again that they're hearing that. They're hearing that, that fun, and, and they're having fun pushing the moon on the, on the front cover. <laughs> it's, very, it, it's, it's very enlivening on a variety of levels. Uh, in looking at your journey, where it's gone, where do you think it goes next? Because you've gone in so many different directions. You've met people around the world, incorporated it into your music. I think that it looks like the next project is, is it's the it's the next cookbook that's pushing me to explore different cultures, travel to different places. Uh, I would love to go to Japan and uh, discover some Japanese cuisine. I've already written a, a tune that has a Japanese flavor to it. Uh, I call it Osaka, and uh, I'd like to discover Indian music. Yeah, because I love Indian food, and so that seems like the natural progression. And I've never been able to understand Indian music. And so that is my next project. I'm going to set out to, to discover what is it about that music that, uh, and, and how to, to play it. It's, it's quite different in, in just the way you think about the music. Well, there's so many different types of Indian music, and you have a country where people speak 80 different languages, so the cultural... Uh, opportunities there, I think, are rather broad. Yes, and uh, Eastern Europe, I love Eastern Europe. Uh, the, the music and uh, the, you know, interesting uh, cultures and history, wow, it's, it's just a, a whole region that uh, is, is yet to discover more. Uh, and uh, then I think that the, there might be another project after that is, is Brian, my partner, is an avid sailor. And so I think at some point we are going to sail and uh, write some music in the process. And so there'll be, uh, that'll be a different journey. Very exciting. Am I pushing it to ask you to play some more? Oh, no. Uh, this is all so beautiful. I want to capture as yes. much of it as we can. I feel like you referenced capturing. We're <laughs> lucky to be in your presence while this is happening, and I want uh, to have as much of this as we can. Well, we just mentioned how much I love East, Eastern European music. I did uh, international folk dancing uh, when I was young, and uh, just the music is, is fantastic for all these different countries. I especially liked Bulgarian music. So I, I really uh, took to that, and uh, the Greek islands and uh, these, this, this region. And I wrote a tune that's in 13-8 time, and I call it A Baker's Dozen.
What's it like for you to move culturally to culturally different settings? And I'll just give you some context. We, Blues Radio International, I was surprised when we started it how much this music, even though it comes from seemingly Western tradition, seems to resonate with people, even people with microtonal scales, very different views of the world and music don't know anything about the tradition that we think blues comes from. Yeah. And I've seen more and more, and as I listen to you, I see how connected it all is. Uh, how would you explain to someone how this all fits together musically? You've, you've covered so many different areas just in the time that we've spent here with you. Uh, well, it's, it's a way to connect with people that's the way we were talking about uh, at the very beginning actually at the uh, uh, and I found that audiences will and like the music from all these different places. If you give them some good music from these different places, uh, people think that they just like one style of music. They say, oh I like blues, I like country and you get people just saying that you know that's what they hone in on just just that one style. But when you offer them different styles one after the other, they like them all. And it shows that we can open our minds and not just listen to one style of music. We can uh, listen and enjoy. And sometimes it, it takes some discovering. Like I'm saying, you know, I don't yet understand this music. And uh, that is kind of exciting for me that I think I'm going to come to that point where I understand this music and I appreciate the nuances of it. And so you know, I think that uh, that we can get there and we have the, the radio, we have the internet, we have ways to connect with other music and uh, I think that uh, it's a, a great exploration. It's beautiful and I haven't mentioned that uh, you had Django Reinhardt's grandson play with you on Paris Skies, right? Yes, on the recording. It was uh, such an honor to have uh, the, uh, the true blood <laughs> grandson of, of the great Django Reinhardt playing on that. It's, it's remarkable, just the number of personalities that you've been able to connect up with and, and personalities, including Les Paul and others, who might never have spoken to one another, but you're the connection for all these people in, in what you play. And that's a very beautiful thing. Well, I've come to realize later that I, I, I've been kind of a connector for people to put different people together. And I guess that's just, you know, one of the roles of life that you discover, hey, you know, I, I guess I've done this a number of times. Maybe that's part of my reason for being on the planet. Well, it, it's done very beautifully and with a lot of inspiration. What would you like yeah, to play you. next? Uh, there's one tune I had just thought of that I, I would really like to share with your audiences. And I should also mention, if, if you have access to the internet and want to, you know, take a look at the, the pairing of the, of the tunes and the recipes and, uh, you know, get some samples, and there's also some, um, uh, some I think, some free, free samples on there, um, you can go to my website, murielanderson.com slash cookbook, and that'll give you some of those. And this is one on, on there, and I wrote this for my great-grandparents uh, who immigrated from Finland to work in the quarries, the granite quarries in Cape Ann, Massachusetts. And in thinking about that time, the challenges and the promise of the new country and the memories of the old country at the same time, those complex emotions, I wrote this tune and I call it The Immigrant.
It's beautiful. I was thinking uh, from our prior discussion about <clears throat> your interest in exploring Asia, you've actually touched Central Asia already, right, with the Tuvan throat yes. singing? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Not that I expect you to replicate it, but... <laughs> All right. Uh, I uh, was amazed by the music of Alash, a group of Tuvan throat singers who came through uh, Nashville on tour. And uh, while they were in town, I asked, I was invited over to a, a barbecue with them. And I asked them, you know, what, what kind of music, what kind of food do you make in Tuva? You know, could you uh, teach me uh, how to make something? And then they said, oh, yes, let's, well, I'll you know, give you a list of ingredients. And, and so the first on the list of ingredients was a live sheep. And so yeah. <laughs> we're in Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, uh, would ground lamb be, be okay? <laughs> and they said, okay. And they showed me how to make these uh, very unique lamb dumplings, a uh, very simple meal, but uh, elegantly, uh, you know, formed. And, and then I wrote a tune in the style. I listened to their music and realized that uh, it's a lot of their culture is, is based around uh, shepherding it's so they and they revere the horse the horse is revered in their culture in their economy and it's you know, essential uh, in uh, herding the uh, the sheep and the goats and uh, the tune I wrote I put in the in the rhythm of the trotting of a horse so I have this this kind of like this and then um, I listened to the kind of the rhythms and, and the and the melodies and so I came from there, uh, I uh, found that when they were coming back through Nashville on tour, they had a show in Nashville that uh, that got canceled. And I asked them if they would come into the recording studio. And they not only came in and played their instruments, but they wrote lyrics for it and sing on it and do the throat singing where they get two different sounds at the same time. And, and part of it sounds almost like a, a sheep, the uh, the buying of a sheep and then there's this whistle that comes on top and then there's this really unusual sound beautiful and you know highly unusual sound and uh, so that's my favorite cut on the album uh, where uh, the Alash Tuvan throws singers sing on that it, it's spectacular and you've done such an amazing thing to draw all this together and to allow your audiences to experience cultures they would never otherwise touch and that that's quite an accomplishment in and of itself now this this song tell us about the story behind this one. Uh, Sakura, this is a. Um, I uh, asked my guitar teacher at the time. For a short time, I was studying from a guitar teacher named Sego Yamada, and I asked him if he could teach me a Japanese piece, and he showed me this Sakura. But he told me, it, really, in order to understand Japanese music, I had to go study Japanese flower arranging. And if you I don't know Ikebana, you don't know Japanese music. Yes, and right. I tried to play Sakura on a koto, so I know the oh, tune. Oh, you did. I, I'm very in a, inept at it, but it was quite an experience to try, so I, I can't wait to hear this. Yes, so yeah, I didn't have a whole lot of time to study flower arranging, so I, I did the next best thing. I went to a Japanese restaurant. Oh, okay. <laughs> And uh, there I uh, looked at the art on the walls and saw how everything was arranged on the table and listened to the language a little bit and the music. And I noticed in all of those things, uh, there's a real politeness, a little holding back. And there's also an attention to space 
and detail, so space and lots of little things. So I tried to incorporate all of those things, the little uh, polite hesitation in some of the timing here and there, and uh, some just kind of letting letting loose of uh, like like petals falling in, in other areas, and try to capture a little bit of the Japanese uh, culture, beautiful culture, in this rendition of Sakura, Cherry Blossom. I'm so impressed just watching the bends because obviously with a koto you you're pressing downward so it's easy to get those deep bends and I see you replicating this on a fretboard it's well, quite I'm, amazing. I, I found I have to do a combination between the classical vibrato and then the rock and roll vibrato up up, up and down and it's almost circular to get that kind of koto like sound. And then I play with the edges of my fingernails so it's more like the quill uh, on the koto. Yeah, it's beautiful how you're able to replicate that. So well, thank you. I'll, I'll ask you anything else you'd like to play for us. I mean, that's <laughs> that's really should be my only question from this point on. <laughs> it's all so beautiful, and well, uh, we're learning a lot along the way. And I, I, I'm very excited to share this with everybody. Well, I suppose I should you know go back to the beginning. What r really inspired me, made me want to play guitar and to pursue this, was hearing the music of Doc Watson country picker from North Carolina. 
Uh, this is Memphis Blues. You know, it's funny on that tune, I played that once for Doc Watson, uh, you know, this is many, many years ago, and he laughed and he said, ah, oh, you're playing my part and Merle's part at the same time. I didn't know that was two guitar players there. I just learned it from the record. <laughs> That's pretty spectacular. What, what's the relationship between blues and all the other types of music we've heard today in your mind? Um, you know, they are... I mean, it's, it's one of many, many styles that gleans from a lot of different styles. So you'll hear bits of, of music from all different places, I think, uh, if you delve into it enough. And that the blues music had a lot of influences and continues to, and I think it's continuing to evolve. It all evolves, and you're helping us tie it all together in a very beautiful way. I really appreciate your being here today. I uh, I'd ask you to keep playing all day if, if that <laughs> oh, would work, you. but I realize you. you've got a life and other things going on besides recording with us. So I can't thank you enough. The last request I had is, can you do something uh, in the way of uh, a musical station identification, just play something and say Muriel Anderson and Blues Radio International? Sure. Anything that occurs to you at the time. This is always an interesting moment. Yeah. I wish I had an MRI going so I could see what happens in people's brains when I ask this question because everyone comes up with something they've never done before, as simple or complex as it may be. This is Muriel Anderson, and you're listening to a very delightful and interesting and sometimes surprising show called Blues Radio International. Thank you very much, Muriel, for being here. And we look forward to hearing so much more from you. When's, when's the next iteration of this beautiful project with food and music coming out? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Um, these, uh, the, the version that we, we have, the Spiral Bound, is currently available. So that's available on my website. And we're looking to do a hardcover as soon as we find a printer. <laughs> and then the... the, the Edition number two will happen when it is ready, when everything is completely baked. It will be out of the oven. Okay, we will look forward to that. Thank you again for being here today. Thank you. <laughs>